Welcome back. In this episode, we take up the doctrine of celestial or eternal marriage. In this crowning ordinance of the temple, men and women most explicitly emulate father and mother in heaven. The restored doctrine begins with the teaching that human beings have the potential to be as God is. This was known and taught among the ancient saints, but was lost in the apostasy. Next, since God is not a lone and single ruler of the universe, nor a father in name only, but an eternal partner with our Heavenly Mother, to be as they are, we also must enter into a sacred partnership like theirs. Indeed, this was the very purpose of the creation and the redeeming work of the Savior Jesus Christ. Like us, ancient saints performed sacred marriages in emulation of our divine parents. Now let's dig in deeper to this. The scriptures and the restoration unabashedly treat humanity as the offspring of God, with full potential to be like God, indeed to be God's in their own right. The Lord told Joseph Smith that those who inherit the celestial kingdom are priests and kings, who have received of his fullness and of his glory, wherefore it is written, they are God's. This doctrine is called theosis, and it was known to ancient Christians and Jews. Irenaeus, bishop of Lyon, before 200 AD, had written, If the word became a man, it was so men may become gods. And this was a standard teaching down to the time of Augustine of Hippo in the early 400s AD. He taught, But he himself that justifies also deifies, for by justifying he makes sons of God. If then we have been made sons of God, then we have also been made gods. We've demonstrated amply in previous episodes that ancient saints did not think of God as a single man, but that our eternal parents are an exalted divine couple. In Genesis, for example, God says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, male and female. God is plural, male and female. Apostle Charles Penrose was counselor to Joseph F. Smith and Heber J. Grant, In 1902, he argued that this verse referred to Heavenly Mother, who he said was the Holy Spirit. The Bible expressly states that God created man in his own image. Unless someone should misconstrue the word man here to mean only Adam, the historian adds, male and female created he them, thus including both our progenitors in the statement that man was created in the image of God. The word man includes both male and female. But if the divine image, to be complete, had to reflect a female as well as a male element, it is self-evident that both must be contained in the deity. And they are. For the divine spirit that in the morning of the creation moved upon the face of the waters, bringing forth life and order, is in the original language of the sacred historian represented in the feminine gender, whatever modern theologians may think of it. But apart from this, when the scriptures represent God as our Father, does it not of necessity imply a mother? There are some words, the meaning of which necessarily implies that which other words denote. Such are child and parent, husband and wife, father and mother, etc. A man may exist alone, and so may a woman, but there can be no fatherhood without motherhood. No husband if there is no wife. Is an exception to be made in the case of him who is called the father of spirits? Elder Penrose was not alone in seeing Heavenly Mother in this passage. Many commentators, both ancient and modern, also saw the divine feminine in that primeval conversation. After all, the name Elohim, gods, is plural, even though in most cases it is translated as God, singular. Importantly, the book of Abraham fixes this. And they went down at the beginning, and they, that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth, and the gods took counsel among themselves and said, Let us go down and form man in our image, after our likeness, and we will give them dominion. In this passage, there are at least three participants in this council, since they counsel among themselves, whereas if there were only two, we would expect the word to be between instead. 
This is the way early Christians understood the passage, as a conversation between three, God the Father, Wisdom the Spirit, and the Word, Jesus Christ. Enoch, in the book of Moses, underscores this even more specifically, showing that the Elohim were male and female. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. In the image of his own body, male and female, created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam. Finally, we will mention this from Brigham Young. We were created upright, pure, and holy, in the image of our father and our mother, in the image of our God. Not only does Brigham Young teach that we have a premortal father and mother, but like the book of Abraham, he also designates them under a single word, God. At least some saints through the ages understood this fact. The Jewish philosopher Philo wrote often of God and wisdom as a divine married couple. The architect who made this universe was at the same time the father of what was thus born, whilst its mother was the knowledge, or wisdom, possessed by its maker. Elsewhere, Philo calls God the father of all things, inasmuch as it is he who has created them, and the husband of wisdom, sowing for the race of mankind the seed of happiness in good and virgin soil. The hymn of the pearl, revered by early Christians, referred to God in this way as well. The disciple says that when he was sent into the world, my parents equipped me and sent me forth. But he became mired in the world, and I forgot the pearl for which my parents had sent me. But all these things that befell me, my parents perceived and were grieved for me. They wrote a letter, From thy father, the king of kings, and thy mother, the mistress of the east, and from thy brother, our second in authority. That is, from God the Father, Heavenly Mother, and Jesus Christ. Later he says, I remembered that I was a son of royal parents. To claim the pearl of great price he was sent for, he must defeat his enemy, the dragon, and he does so when, my father's name I named over him, and the name of our second in power, and that of my mother, the Queen of the East. And I snatched away the pearl and turned to go back to my father's house. He pursues his journey, and on the way he is endowed with a sacred robe. And my bright robe, which I had stripped off, and the toga that was wrapped with it, my parents had sent thither by the hand of their treasurers. He puts this on, and arrives at the gate, and is received back into the heavenly kingdom. Most commentators agree that the heavenly mother spoken of in this hymn is the Holy Spirit. Other early Christian writings frame the Trinity the same way, but calling Heavenly Mother by the name Wisdom. So Silvanus says, Return, my son, to your first father, God, and Wisdom, your mother, from whom you came into being from the very first. Genesis depicts the creation as a series of divisions. Light from darkness, the waters above from the waters below, night from day, the land from the sea, and then finally, male from female. The rabbis saw that the first human was created and only afterward divided into male and female. And they wondered how this happened. Rabbi Jeremiah ben Elisar in the 200 ADs said, When the Holy One created the first human, he created him as an androgyne, that is, both male and female. As it is said, male and female he created them. Writing about the same time, Rabbi Samuel ben Naaman opined, When the Holy One created the first human, he created for him a double face, and sawed him and made him backs, a back here and a back there, as it is said, back and before you formed me. Others objected, saying, But it says he took one of his ribs, Salot, to which Rabbi Samuel responded, It means one of his sides. Rabbi Samuel pointed out that the word understood to refer to Adam's rib, zela, normally meant side, and he cited Exodus 26.20 20 as just one instance. And for the second side, zela, of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be 20 boards. There are numerous other instances like this, so he argued Adam's zela was not just a bone from Adam's chest wall, but rather one entire side of him. 
The notion that Adam and Eve were created together and only then separated is an old one. Many early writings taught that not just humanity, but all the heavenly beings, even God, had originally come forth as dual male-female pairs. So, for example, one early Christian group passed on this teaching thus, For this is the will of the Father, not to allow anything to happen in the heavens apart from a sudzuki, that is, a married male-female pair. One group of pre-Christian Jews actually thought that it was not the true God, but the God of this world, Satan, that had separated Adam and Eve. In the Apocalypse of Adam, that first man tells his son Seth, When God had created me out of the earth, along with Eve, your mother, we resembled the great eternal angels. Then Satan, the ruler of the demons and the powers, divided us in wrath, and we became two separate beings, and the glory of our hearts left us. Whether it was God or Satan that divided man and woman is less important here than the notion that they first came forth as a male-female pair, a married couple, and that this was a reflection of God's own nature. We have cited previously part of an exchange between Simon Magus and the Apostle Peter in the Clementine homilies. Simon Magus accused Peter of polytheism because there was obviously more than one person conversing at the creation. Peter answered by explaining that it appeared this way because God and wisdom were joined like one soul, but were yet two. And that this is also why Adam and Eve were first created together and then separated. Peter answered, One is he who said to his wisdom, Let us make a man. But his wisdom was that with which he himself always rejoiced, as with his own spirit. It is united as soul to God, but it is extended by him as hand, fashioning the universe. On this account also one man was made, and from him went forth also the female. And being a unity, generically, it is yet a duality." Peter describes wisdom as a hand stretched forth out from God to create the world. But although God and wisdom are one, in some profound sense, they are not identical or equivalent. Wisdom is united to God like his own soul. Furthermore, the two always rejoice together, which a lone individual cannot do. The term rejoice is meant to turn our minds to Proverbs 8.30, where wisdom says, I was daily his that is God's, delight, rejoicing always before him. This is the wisdom that sits by God's throne, his divine wife. Peter then explained that Adam and Eve were united in the same way as God and wisdom, a unity and yet a duality, one and yet two. That is, humanity came forth as a male-female pair because that is the nature of God. If humans can become as God is, and God exists as a united divine man and woman, then humans also must be united in this way. Paul had said, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. And this passage has always been difficult for commentators to understand because the doctrine of eternal marriage was rejected by the Christian factions that went on to become the dominant Orthodox churches. But at least one group of early Christians, the Valentinians, remembered and taught that their own marriages were meant to be earthly reflections of that celestial union. Their Gospel of Philip says, Christ came that he might correct again the separation that happened from the beginning and unite the two in the bridal chamber. Another text from about 150 AD from yet a different Christian group teaches a similar idea. In it, Mary Magdalene tells the other disciples, Let us praise his greatness, for he has joined us together and made us into human beings. The phrase, made us into human beings, refers to restoring the disciples through sacred marriages to the unified state of Adam and Eve before they were separated. The necessity of sacred marriage for those that would become like God is also part of the doctrine of the restoration. In order to obtain the highest degree of glory, A man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, and if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. 
As the Gospel Topics essay on Heavenly Mother clarifies, men and women cannot be exalted without each other. Just as we have a Father in Heaven, we have a Mother in Heaven. Thus, celestial marriage is the crowning ordinance of the modern temple. Like Latter-day Saints, saints in earlier ages have performed sacred marriages in emulation of our Divine Parents. In the Old Testament, we have only remnants and echoes of this, but the same pattern is clearly visible. In a previous episode, we looked at the royal marriage described in Psalm 45 and pointed out how, like our own temple marriage, it was preceded by anointing. God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness and clothing in sacred robes. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. The princess is decked in her chamber with gold-woven robes and many colored robes. And the word is rikma, that is, her robes are fashioned according to the pattern of the veil of the temple and the garments of the high priest. The location of the wedding is perhaps deliberately vague. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king, where palace is the word hakal, which is also the word for temple, so we likely have a temple marriage. The couple is promised a great posterity, an element that figures in the modern ceremony as well. Your sons will carry on the dynasty of your ancestors. You will make them princes throughout the land. Furthermore, in this ancient ceremony, the Geberah, the great lady, officiates, though her exact function is lost to memory. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. The book of Ruth suggests that this pattern for marriage was not reserved for royalty. Naomi instructs Ruth to wash, anoint herself, put on special clothes, and go under veil of night to meet her future husband Boaz. Ezekiel describes Israel's allegorical wedding to the Lord in the same way. I spread my skirt over thee to cover thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, and thou becamest mine. Then I washed thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work. This again is rikmah, the fabric of the veil and the outer garment of the high priest. And I girded thee about with fine linen. And this is shesh, the fabric that the undergarments and tunics of the ordinary priests were made of. So this is the same pattern of ritual washing, anointing, and clothing that prepares one for the sacred marriage. The book of Tobit, which was revered as scripture until it was rejected by the rabbis and apostate Christians, suggests that ancient saints understood that a sacred marriage could be for time and for all eternity. In the story, Tobias asks Raguel for his daughter Sarah to wife. He responds, I will give her to you just as the law of Moses commands. God in heaven has arranged this marriage, so take her as your wife. From now on you belong to each other, Sarah is yours today and forever. Then Raguel called his daughter. When she came in, he took her by the hand and gave her to Tobias with his blessing. Take her to be your wife according to the teachings in the law of Moses. May the God of heaven give you a happy life together. We mentioned that the Valentinian Christians possessed a remnant of the earlier doctrine of sacred marriage. This deserves further examination, not just because it shows that Christians before the apostasy knew all about celestial marriage, but because it shows that they also understood the sacred marriage on earth imitated Heavenly Mother and Father. Now, while the Valentinians had that concept and that ritual, they often misinterpreted it, which was easy to do because this had been a closely guarded doctrine. The apostles did not even share it openly with the general membership of the church. As St. Basil said in about 360 AD, of the beliefs and practices which are preserved in the church, some we possess derived from written teaching, others we have received delivered to us in a mystery by the tradition of the apostles, and both of these have the same force. He then said in relation to a different temple-related practice, does not this come from that unpublished and secret teaching which our fathers guarded in silence out of the reach of curious meddling and inquisitive investigation? Well had they learned the lesson that the awful dignity of the mysteries is best preserved by silence. 
Because temple teachings were guarded extremely closely in that age, they were even more susceptible to misunderstanding. Even so, the Valentinians preserved much of the original doctrine of eternal marriage. First of all, they considered that Adam and Eve's separation required mending. When Eve was still with Adam, death did not exist. When she was separated from him, death came into being. If he enters again and attains his former self, death will be no more. They further saw Christ's mission as healing that rift. Therefore Christ came that he might correct again the separation that happened from the beginning, and unite the two, and give life to those who died in the separation, and unite them. But the woman is always united with her husband in the bridal chamber. Indeed, those who are united in the bridal chamber will no longer be divided. Notice in this passage that reuniting Adam and Eve gives life to and can unite all their descendants as well. This is just the way it is represented in the modern temple too. All through the endowment that culminates in the marriage ordinance, men and women are instructed to consider that they, individually, are Adam or Eve. Then notice that those who are united in the bridal chamber will no longer be divided. We don't know if the Valentinians still believe that their individual marriages would endure forever, but they preserved the words and concept anyway. And it is clear that this reuniting ordinance had to be performed in the bridal chamber. Modern saints also understand that celestial marriage must be performed in the properly designated place and under legitimate authority, or it is of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection of the dead. In the Restoration, the ordinances are arranged in a set progression, with celestial marriage as the pinnacle. The Valentinians also thought of sacred marriage as the highest ordinance, and they explained it this way. There were three buildings specifically for sacrifice in Jerusalem. The one facing the west was called the Holy. Another facing south was called the Holy of Holy. The third facing east was called the Holy of the Holies the place where only the high priest enters. Baptism is the holy building. Redemption is the holy of the holy. The holy of the holies is the bridal chamber. This passage speaks of three progressively more sacred rituals, with baptism as the first, something called redemption as the second, and the ordinance of the bridal chamber or sacred marriage as the highest. It compares these to three divisions of the Israelite temple, But what is the redemption ritual spoken of? Irenaeus said this redemption was to make the disciple incapable of being seized or seen by the principalities and powers, that is, the demons or gods, and that their inner man may ascend on high. This may seem foreign to us at first, but it is actually the intent of the modern temple's washing, anointing, and endowment. According to Brigham Young, these were to enable you to walk back to the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels, and gain your eternal exaltation in spite of earth and hell. Thus, the Valentinian redemption ritual corresponds to the temple endowment, and it precedes the sacred marriage just as it does for our own. Let's turn then to the Valentinian marriage itself. Virtually every faithful Valentinian disciple would have been required to enter into this holy form of marriage inasmuch as it enacted and embodied the sacred marriage of the Father and the Mother above. Irenaeus said, For some of them prepare a bridal chamber and perform a sort of mystic rite, pronouncing certain expressions with those who are being initiated, and affirm that it is a spiritual marriage which is celebrated by them, after the likeness of the conjunctions above. These conjunctions are the male-female pairs the Sudsagis, that we have spoken of previously. All the heavenly beings were thought to have come forth as pairs this way, following the pattern of God's own existence as a male-female divine pair. The Valentinians called a marriage a mystery in the original sense of a secret and sacred ordinance. Great is the mystery of marriage, for without it the world would not exist. The meaning here is not that they didn't understand marriage, but that it was a sacred ordinance and that it was the divine marriage that brought forth the entire world. Paul had written of marriage as a sacred ordinance as well. 
For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Again, not that the apostle did not understand, but that it was a sacred ordinance. Where did the Valentinian marriage take place? There's one phrase in the text that we've been examining that has caught the attention of Latter-day Saints more than any other. One receives the bride or bridegroom from the mirrored bridal chamber. Some of the rooms employed for the marriage ceiling ordinance in modern temples are arranged with large mirrors on either side of the altar where the couple can gaze, as it were, into an eternity of reflections of themselves together. This has caused some Latter-day Saint readers to conclude that the Valentinians had the same interior design preference as we do. They didn't. (laughs) But the real significance is much more profound, especially for our understanding of Heavenly Mother. The mirrored bridal chamber means that the earthly bridal chamber was the mirror, duplicate or mirror image of the heavenly bridal chamber. This comes out further in the following passage. The Lord did everything in a mystery, a baptism, and a chrism, that's anointing, and a Eucharist, that's the sacrament, and a redemption, which we've talked about, and a bridal chamber. He said, I came to make the things below like the things above, and the things outside like those inside. I came to unite them in this place. Both anciently and in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today, sacred marriage is in similitude of our Heavenly Parents' union. During a sermon in The Grove in Nauvoo, the Prophet Joseph Smith taught, No man can obtain an eternal blessing unless the contract or covenant be made in view of eternity. Those who keep no eternal law in this life or make no eternal contracts are single and alone in the eternal world. The earthly is the image of the heavenly, shows that it is by the multiplication of lives that the eternal worlds are created and occupied. Franklin Richards, who recorded these words, explained how he and others understood Joseph's remarks. From the above, I deduce that we may make an eternal covenant with our wives, and in the resurrection claim that which is our own, and enjoy blessings and glories peculiar to those in that condition, even the multiplication of spirits in the eternal world. Without referring to Heavenly Mother directly, this passage shows that Joseph was strongly alluding publicly to what he was teaching specifically and directly in private. The celestial marriage on earth was a reflection of a great celestial marriage in heaven, that of our heavenly parents. Finally, we draw our viewers' attention to two implications of the foregoing discussion for modern temple worship. The first is that although in the current form of the presentation of the endowment, Elohim is represented visually and vocally as Heavenly Father alone, The ancient understanding of Elohim, including in the Book of Abraham, was the gods, plural, certainly encompassing Heavenly Mother as well as Heavenly Father. Then, for those familiar with the wording of the modern temple sealing ceremony, we note that the blessings promised are divided neatly into two groups that perfectly mirror the ancient understanding of the roles of Heavenly Father and Mother. Blessings associated with the Father, authority, and rule are grouped together. These are preceded by blessings identified anciently with Heavenly Mother, clothing, glory, and spirit offspring. Clothing, of course, reflects Heavenly Mother's role in weaving creation and clothing the kings, priests, and faithful saints in sacred garments. Heavenly Mother was identified anciently as the divine glory, the Shekinah, and the Holy Spirit. And the ability to bring forth spirit children is referred to in Doctrine and Covenants section 132 as eternal lives. This was the meaning of one of the names of Heavenly Mother anciently, Chayot, Fountain of Life, the Lives, and so forth. This very precise arrangement in the pronouncement of those blessings is one more indication that celestial marriage, as we know it in the Restoration, points us toward the loving, eternal relationship of our Heavenly Mother and Father. Join us next time as we briefly explore scriptures and traditions showing that Jesus Christ himself was married in the same way. Join us then.